in fact, let me ask you that verbally. Has anybody come across that idea? Have you ever heard it mentioned that the BBC is somehow left wing? It's a very common opinion. Has anybody heard that? Just type it or shout it out. Yes, thank you, Moni. So it's quite a common opinion, and it's and it's an opinion which, in, in my humble opinion, seems to be spreading. It seems to be gaining ground. Um, so that's one of the things I'm going to look at today. Now, slide three, the reason that that is a problem for the BBC and for the rest of us is that the BBC has a statutory commitment to be politically neutral. And I'm sure you've done this with Chris. So unlike newspapers and magazines, the BBC and other broadcasters like Channel 4, Sky News, ITV News and so on, they are obliged to be politically neutral and to not take sides in debates and conflicts. And you, you can see this on the BBC and on ITV and Channel 4. And sometimes it, it's very obvious when they are making a huge effort to be politically neutral. The classic example is Question Time. So the BBC programme, I think it's Fiona Bruce who chairs it now. So Fiona's in the middle and, you know, outside of COVID, you'd have a big audience of members of the public. And on the panel, you'd have four or five spokespeople, Labour, Conservative, Liberal, SNP or whoever. So that's a good indication of what the BBC is supposed to do. It's supposed to be politically neutral. So everybody pretty much gets the same amount of time, the same opportunity to speak and so on. And it's very, 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 very difficult to do because some TV programmes on the BBC or some articles on the website, they will take a particular position and other political positions um, will be excluded because there isn't enough time. Or, for example, Andrew Marr will interview Boris Johnson by himself, and then the next week he will interview Keir Starmer. So it, it, when the B, I say the BBC is politically, politically neutral, it doesn't mean that every programme, every article, every piece of output has to be balanced. But over a period of time, the BBC and Channel 4 and so on should not take sides in debates and conflicts. Um, so this idea that the BBC might be left wing is actually um, a, a problem and, a, and a, a concern for BBC managers. And it should be a concern for the rest of us as well, um, because we like to think that the BBC gives us um, impartial, um, objective, politically neutral reporting about the world around us. So that's that's really what I want to concentrate on uh, for the first part of the show today, is, is to consider this idea um, that the BBC... Um, is actually left-wing, as accused. Um, so slide four, wh where the BBC should be, this is what we expect, this is the normative expectation, is that the BBC should be pretty much in the middle. It has a statutory commitment. In other words, by law, the BBC um, is expected to be there politically. Now, just to confirm, because I, I find that even second-year and third-year students still, still use this word bias, B-I-A-S, quite a lot when referring to, to, to news organisations. And, and I'm sure you know this, but just to confirm, the legislation in the UK is different for broadcasters and newspapers. So newspapers are allowed to be left-wing or right-wing, and they're completely proud of it, and they're unashamedly so. So the Daily Mail takes a right-wing position. The Guardian takes a generally left-wing position. That's acceptable. That's normal. So I wouldn't use the word bias, they're just taking a political position. The BBC, Channel 4, Sky News, however, broadcasters have to be down the middle. That's what's expected of them. So slide five. Um, th this opinion about the BBC being left-wing has been around for a long time. I even remember it, believe it or not, from my dim and distant childhood, um, that you'd occasionally hear people say the BBC is left-wing, the BBC is left-wing. And you very rarely, if ever apart from people like me and Chris and other academics, do you hear people su suggest that the BBC is right-wing? Uh, and some people, yeah, they do believe that it's impartial. Uh, but the general opinion, which is growing, is that the BBC is somehow on the left. Um, and here, here's an example from 2015. I don't know if you remember, but we had an election in 2015. It seems like ancient history, but it's only six years ago. Uh, and uh, Nigel Farage is quoted there. He was on Question Time uh, one evening in the run-up to the election, and uh, and he said that the, the questions that were coming from the audience and, and the booing and the, the sounds from the audience, it was clear that the BBC was left-wing, and he blamed the BBC for basically packing the audience with uh, left-wingers, which hence reflected the fact that the BBC itself 
his left wing. So the quote in the blue box, he said there just seems to be a total lack of comprehension on this panel and indeed amongst this audience, which is a remarkable audience even by the left wing standards of the BBC. And the very next day, <clears throat> Janet Daly, um, a well-known opinion columnist in the Daily Telegraph, uh, she confirmed and agreed with Farage. Farage was right over the left-wing bias of the audience, truly shocking even by the BBC standards. Um, so this is, um, this is six years ago, and over the last six years I've noticed, I've actually switched off quite a lot about this because I find it becomes boring now um, because people just keep repeating it, and it's, it's now shifted online. So uh, you, you, you may have come across this on Twitter or or um, Instagram or any of the other social media feeds. And this is something I noticed um, last year, slide number six, um, on Facebook. I know Facebook tends to be used by people of mine and Chris's generation rather than your generation. Uh, but it's, it's just as vitriolic and it's just full of opinion just like anywhere else. Um, so th there's what here? There's Cy Ferret. I'm not sure that Cy Ferret is a real person with a name like that. Maybe he is, I don't know. Dave Hook, Joy Dev and Nick Horn and Andrew Zor. What's that? One, two, three, four, five. So five people here, they're all completely agreeing with each other um, that the BBC is, is left wing. But look at here at my highlighted words. So the yellow ovals. So Cy Ferret says that the BBC is, is well known for its bias. Like, you know, like it's obvious, like, you know, the law of gravity exists. It's obvious. It's a, it's a given. Dave Hook goes further. He says um, the BBC is extreme far left far left Marxist you know it's not just left it's extreme and it's far and it's Marxist so there's three extra words there to confirm his uh, fervent belief Cy Ferret confirms next paragraph leftist agenda and he says that's a fact no debate about that no discussion according to Cy that's a fact Joy Dev says most Brits don't trust the BBC which is not actually true because when you look at the opinion polls, the BBC is one of the most trusted institutions in the UK. Second, I think, only to the NHS, National Health Service. Cy Ferret come, piles back in and said uh, uh, anyone who likes the BBC would definitely be Labour. So there you go. So anybody who votes Labour is left wing and therefore and BBC. Uh, BBC is hated. Uh, said Nick Horn, and the most uh, the most damning. Uh, um, a statement comes at the end from Andrew Zor. BBC equals biased broadcasting channel, pro-Muslim, left-wing socialist channel. He means all of that, of course, as a, a whacking great insult. So, so this is kind of quite typical online. And, um, and, and I was tempted to get involved in this debate. And um, I'll talk in a few moments about my PhD, which was six years' work. And I analysed 1,625 articles, and I did nearly 30 hours of interviews with journalists. Um, and the problem with online discussions is that all of my experience, all my PhD work, and all of Chris's work, and so on, if we actually got involved in a debate, like, well, I put the word debate in speech marks, a debate like this online, um, they would, the people involved here, Cy Ferret and his mates, would just say, oh, you're wrong. You're a lefty too. You know, you're an academic. Of course you think that. So so the point here really is that the quality, and you know this, the quality of debate online is um, light years away from what we would call informed debate. It's opinion, basically. And it's opinion that's based on little more than prejudice and preconceived ideas. And maybe Cy Ferret and Nick Horn and Joy Dev have read an article or two uh, that basically confirms what they already believe. But they don't really engage, well, certainly they don't engage with the work that Chris and I do. So, and I'm sure Chris has spoken about this, and I've noticed on Moodle there's a heck of a lot of stuff on there, but there, there are, there's there been lots of academic work um, looking at the BBC uh, and considering its political position. And uh, my PhD and a, my subsequent book, um, um, are also focused on that. So, so just be aware, the first point of this session is, is just making you aware that there's a heck of a lot of, of opinion out there that, that, that says, slide seven, that the BBC is on, on the left. So it's over on the left, it should be in the middle. And it certainly isn't on the right. So th this is the kind of the general feeling about the BBC. It's a very common feeling. Um, so slide eight. So if, if we're going to be intelligent adults, as I know that we all are, 
and we want to um, test this hypothesis. So it's a theory. Let's think of it as a theory. The theory is that the BBC is left wing. So the first thing we do, slide number eight, is that we define left wing. Uh, and this is the problem. And I have occasionally in the past challenged people on during online debates about what they mean by left wing. And if you think about that, there's also a, lo a load of other labels that are associated with left wing and they tend to be quite pejorative. So Marxist, we've had that extreme left, far left, hard left. These are phrases that you hear frequently. Socialist, of course. And, and these labels, um, th they are pejorative, typically. People don't call somebody, a, somebody doesn't call somebody a socialist typically as a compliment. Um, quite often they use it as, a, as, a, as an insult. And you actually saw that with the American election campaign in November. Joe Biden was frequently called Marxist or socialist. And in America, th those words are even more loaded. Um, and Joe Biden's team spent a long time denying something that he actually isn't, if that makes sense. You know, so, so the right in politics use these labels. I'm sure Chris has touched on this or maybe even done a bit more on this. They, they will probably, they use political labels to, to, to denigrate and, and, and to, to criticise somebody. Not, not criticising their beliefs or their policies or what they actually want to do with, with, if they get into power, but just using labels, socialist, Marxist, far left, and, and so on. There's loads of other ones, anarchist, you know. So the first thing we're going to do as intelligent, thinking, sentient human beings is we're going to define what left wing is. Now, if we were in a class right now, we'd have a discussion about it. It's very difficult to do on, um, on, on Zoom. So, I, so I'm, going to, I'm going to skip ahead slightly. And I, I know that you've done some of this already with Chris in previous classes. Um, so slide number nine. Um, to understand left wing, we need to go back a little bit into history. Um, so what I've done on slide nine is laid out the first 2,000 years, basically. And when you see it like that, it makes us realize that's so, so since the since the uh, the arrival on planet Earth of Jesus Christ in the year zero. So this is how how far we've come, um, you know, sort of intellectually and in terms of civilization and so on. Um, so year zero all the way to 1700. Not much really changed over that period, believe it or not. Um, so Britain for that most of that period was a monarchy. Uh, the power was in the hands of the king, typically, or a few um, people at the top of the tree. Um, there wasn't really a parliament that we would know and understand, uh, with people voting for MPs and all that sort of stuff. There was a sort of parliament, but it, it wasn't anything like it is today. Um, so things didn't really start changing. You could say sort of middle of the 1600s. We had a civil war, you know about that, right? So we had Parliament versus the, the monarchy, and the, the powers of the monarchy were greatly reduced in 1640, 1650. Uh, but they were kind of restored. But let's skip forward, because I think the really interesting period sort of happens from about 1750 onwards. So 1750 onwards, there is a period, if you see it relate, uh, referred to in literature, it's generally called the Enlightenment with a capital E, the Enlightenment. So 1750 onwards, maybe a bit before, was a period of, 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 of great sort of intellectual growth. Uh, and as it says in the narrative there, Britain was transformed. Philosophers started to challenge entrenched views on freedom, liberty, morality, etc. So this is called the Enlightenment. So really what they were doing, these very intelligent people, these scholars of the 18th century, they were kicking against uh, basically established principles about uh, monarchy, about the church, about the, you know, how teachings of the Bible are interpreted. Not so much questioning the Bible itself, but how they're portrayed and how they are um, explained um, to the common public. So, and that was, that was inc incredibly revolutionary. And many of these philosophers suffered, you know, from, from having such outspoken views. So freedom, liberty and morality, uh, uh, but, you know, we kind of take these, they're, they're abstract words, but in the 17th, uh, in the 18th and 19th century, they really meant something uh, pretty incredible uh, when the, the, the laws were actually changed. Also, at the same time, the Industrial Revolution, you've all heard of that, right? So the, the advent of steam power and machines and railways and, you know, factories based on steam power and so on. The Industrial Revolution prompted enormous changes in people's lives. So people typically moved from the countryside to what to newly uh, growing um, urban centres and industrial towns and so on. So there's huge change in, 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 the, in the UK and other countries as well. And 
off the back of all this, there were key changes in legislation. So one of the most significant is the abolition of slavery in 1833. Um, but that, the important thing to remember that, and you hear that, you heard that quite a lot last year, Boris Johnson and people were saying, oh yes, of course, Britain abolished slavery before most other countries did. I mean, in the United States, of course, it took another three decades until the 1860s um, to, um, to actually abolish slavery. So Boris Johnson said, oh, you know, Britain were pioneers in that. But what he doesn't tell you is there was massive resistance for the Slavery Abolition Act uh, by people who benefited from slavery, basically plantation owners in the, in the Caribbean uh, and so on. You know, so wh when politicians remind you of these things, just remember that when it happened, there was massive resistance to, to these things, typically from factory owners and, um, and, and people, like I said, who benefited from the exploitation of people. Um, another key piece of legislation was the Factory Act in the same year, 1833. That Those two acts of Parliament were pretty enormous, really. The Factory Act prevented children from working in factories and children from working down coal mines. Um, now, we don't have photographs of, of those uh, that period because it was before photography, but I have seen sketches in books and drawings and paintings and read books about what it was like to work down a coal mine at the age of eight years old. And we think about that now, and that is barbaric, isn't it? To have, I mean, it's, it's only 200 years ago. I say only, but when you look at the grand span of history, 200 years is no time at all. And again, people in Parliament and rich industrialists, they complained about it. They said, how are we going to make any money if we can't send children down coal mines or have women with kids in their arms, literally working at machines for 12 hours a day? It's a different world, a different world. So the Factory Act, Slavery Abolition Act, 1833, that was a big year for British politics and the Reform Acts. So the Reform Act basically reformed how we elect our MPs, how we, who votes and, and uh, how people are uh, elected. So in the 19th century, in the 1800s, there were actually quite a few significant changes. And I've put democracy question mark there. Uh, you know, so we, we did, didn't really have democracy because obviously women couldn't vote until uh, 1918 or so. You know, so half the population was disenfranchised until 100 years ago. But we were moving in the right direction. We were moving in the right direction. And it was around about this time of the Reform Acts and the Factory Act and so on that left-wing politics really started um, to be born. Uh, left-wing politics as we know it now. So slide number 10, the advent of left-wing politics. And you might recognise that magnificently whiskered man in the middle. That's Karl Marx, born 1818, nearly 200, just over 200 years ago and died in 1883 and and he he wrote a lot he was he was a revolutionary thinker and a very prolific author um to be honest i've tried reading his original work like das kapital which was his magnum opus uh, but it's heavy going i don't know if chris if you've actually got from cover to cover but i don't know many people who who have actually because he's he's uh, i find him very verbose as a writer i find all victorian writers quite verbose but his ideas were, were in, incredibly enlightening and incredibly revealing so what marx did in around about 1850 he analyzed the effects of the industrial revolution so all of these big factories growing up and the you know the places like manchester and birmingham you know hugely growing as cities with factories and coal mines and pollution and all that sort of stuff and so he analyzed the revolution industrial revolution and he argued that the working class which means the vast majority of the population so for example my mother uh, has done uh, has studied our family history she's been doing it for a long time and all of my relatives um, in 1850 or thereabouts they were all working in factories or in coal mines okay and I suspect if Chris I don't know about Chris if you do your family history Chris I don't know what Chris knows but I suspect that his family uh, were, were in similar situations um, and your family's folks as well uh, students I, I'm sure that your family the point is that the vast majority of people by definition were working class there were very, very few people who were not working class uh, back in the Victorian period. But and the key point is that Marx argued that the working class were oppressed. Oppressed, that's the key word, I've highlighted it. They suffered unnecessarily, 
said Marx, and gained little from the profit-making process. The ultimate solution, said Marx, was for people to join together to create a more just and equitable world. world. So he kind of emphasised this idea of the collective. It's a group of people, the majority of people. On the right-hand side, the capitalists, as they were sometimes called and sometimes called now, um, they objected greatly to Marx's idea. He was a dangerous revolutionary because he was turning the whole concept of politics on its head. So politics up until that point had been all been about the elite, about the, about the landed gentry, about a certain group of people who have a, almost like a God-given right to rule over us. And it kind of comes from monarchy. That's why I personally have an issue with monarchy, because it's all by birth. It's not by achievement or merit. So I'm sure the Queen's a lovely person, and most of her family probably are as well, you know, but they are there because they were born to the right father, essentially. And, and I, I struggle with that. Capitalists said, well, that's the natural order of things. You know, people are rich and privileged and they should have the right to rule. And, um, and capitalists, they, they did, they resisted government legislation to put limits on their profit-making activities. So stopping kids working down coal mines is a restriction on your profit-making activity because you can pay a child far less than you can pay an adult. Um, so the capitalists really disliked Karl Marx. They really disliked Karl Marx because his revolutionary thinking was disruptive to, uh, to, to their profit-making process. Um, slide number 11, the story continues. In the late 1800s, many people were inspired by Marx, and there were other thinkers as well, people like William Morris, various others. And this period saw the growth of trade unions. Trade unions don't really get a very good press these days, but if you look back on, on the history of trade unions, we all have a lot to thank trade unions for. Um, so since their, 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 their beginnings in the modern form in the late 19th century, it's all about working people campaigning for better paying conditions, getting together as a group. Recently, for example, um, Uber Eats and Just Eats, uh, you know, the, all those food delivery services, that some of the delivery drivers for those companies got together and formed a trade union because they were campaigning for better pay and better, and I think holiday pay as well. I'm not sure if they were successful. But trade unions are still extremely uh, relevant uh, in the modern world. Um, so on, to on top of trade unions, there was also a group of intellectuals, um, other thinkers and Christian socialists. If you actually look at the Bible, there is a, a way of interpreting the Bible. I mean, some people argue that Jesus Christ is a socialist because he's all about, you know, sort of, you know, he doesn't look down on people. He likes to, he, he tries to free people from oppression. Um, he encourages people to be generous. He threw the money lenders out of the temple, for goodness sakes, you know. So, so there's lots of arguments to say that, uh, that the great Jesus Christ was uh, on this side of the political spectrum as well. The right wingers, of course, will completely disagree with that. But hey, that's another debate. So all of these different groups sort of ganged together and they created the Labour Party in uh, 1900. So this was a major moment in British political history and British social history. Because for the first time, the work, working class people had a political party to represent their interests. So that's a key point, 1900. Fast forward 40, 50 years, <clears throat> obviously in 1939 to 45, we had the World War II. And out of the back of World War II, obviously, there was huge amounts of suffering and sacrifice. And, uh, and it was amazing that in 1945, Winston Churchill, who had been this great wartime leader, um, he stood for re-election 1945 and he lost. He lost by a landslide because the Labour Party under Clement Attlee had this incredibly ambitious and positive and optimistic and, and rejuvenating package of policies that they sold to the British people. Uh, and the British people voted in the Labour Party in massive numbers. So 1945, Winston Churchill lost power. Clement Attlee was voted in. And the Labour Party embarked on, probably, I can't think of another example, the most revolutionary period in British politics. So, and it's not that long ago. This is within my mother's generation, within my mother's lifetime. Um, and she sometimes mentions how revolutionary it was. The most revolutionary thing was, of course, was the National Health Service. You know, so from 1948 onwards, if you have a health problem, you get it free at the point of use. Compare that to other countries, notably the United States, uh, and it, it, it really is completely revolutionary. So, but it wasn't only the health service, it was things like secondary education was massively improved, um, pensions, welfare benefits, and so on. So the welfare state, as we call it now, um, was developed uh, as a result of the suffering of World War II. 
and uh, and it was the Labour government that brought it in. And again, the right wingers, the Conservatives, they objected. They absolutely hated it back then. But it's become so popular, particularly the National Health Service, that the Conservatives mess around with it at their peril. They do still try to do it, of course, but they don't call it what it really is. That's another story altogether. But the concept here in the 40s and onwards is that the states, you know, the, 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 the machinery of government behind the scenes looks after people from the cradle to the grave. So from the moment you're born to the moment you die, the state, the collective, all of us, society, we all look after each other using the government as a positive force. That's kind of what post-World War II politics was all about, the welfare state. We're, you know, it's, a, it's become a cliche now, it doesn't mean anything, but we're all in it together, you know? I always doubt it when you hear right-wingers, conservatives say we're all in it together, as David Cameron did and Boris Johnson does with COVID. I think, well, I'm not that, that convinced, really, because the Conservative Party does not have a tradition of collectivism. It does not have a tradition. Tradition. It's all about individualism on the right hand, on the right of British politics. Anyway, that's another point. So fast forward again, slide thirteen. Uh, the next real major step was basically the nineteen sixties to the mid nineteen seventies, and this period. Um, if it was a kind of an economic revolution after World War Two with the welfare state, um, in the sixties and seventies there was what we call a social revolution. A social revolution. So many of the things that we now take for granted and some of the battles that are still being fought, they began in the 1960s and 70s. They really, I wouldn't say they began, but they really took off in the 1960s and 70s. So women's rights, for example, took huge strides forward in the 1960s. The divorce laws were changed in 1969. Prior to that, if a woman was in an abusive marriage, it was very, very difficult for her to leave because of various financial and legal restrictions. Uh, and, and, if you're, and, if you're, and if you don't believe me on that, or any of these things, just go back, have a look on Wikipedia, just look at the history of, of these changes in laws. The abortion law was changed in 1967. Prior to that, it was completely illegal to have an abortion, extreme in, except in extreme um, circumstances. And one of the reasons they changed the law is that women who needed an abortion were, were having what were called backstreet abortions, done by people who weren't qualified. Women were dying, kids were suffering unnecessarily. So the abortion law was changed after a a very long and you know, it's a big moral ethical issue isn't it it's very difficult um to discuss but but it needs to be discussed and uh, so the abortion law was uh, paid in 1967 and probably most significantly for all, all of the the women listening to this um show um this lecture you you have a lot to thank the women of 1974 and the late 1960s there was a wonderful movie a few years ago about the women who worked at a ford factory in essex about their campaign for the Equal Pay Act that came out in 1970. So all of these things sort of started from below, people campaigning, protesting on the street, like we saw with Black Lives Matter and so on. Protest does make a difference. The right don't like you to think that protest makes a difference because they don't like protests, so they tell you it doesn't make a difference. But if you look back in history, the social revolution of the 60s and 70s, most of that started with protest, actually people walking on the street. You know, so it does make a difference. Don't be discouraged from that. Ethnic minorities also, even we, even though we still have major issues with racism, um, the progress we've made in the last 50 years, please don't underestimate it. We have made enormous progress uh, in terms of uh, race relations, as it was called back in the day. So there are actually three race, race relations acts, 65, 68 and 1976. And all of these, incidentally, all of these acts of parliament were introduced by a, a left-wing Labour government. So when people say left-wing and in a critical way, they are in a roundabout way criticising this. But all of us, I think, in this room would agree that these were major positive steps forward. It's called progressive politics. That's, what, that's why one reason it's called progressive. But there are a bunch of people who think these were retrograde steps. They were steps backwards. So Race Relations Act. Prior to the Race Relations Act, it was acceptable to say in a job advert, white people only in this country, in the UK, in my lifetime. It was acceptable to say that. It was acceptable to pay uh, non-white people less money. It was acceptable and legal. Can you believe it? In my lifetime, and I'm not that old, 
you know. So we've made incredible progress. The Race Relations Act started to chip away at those injustices. And also LGBTQ, up until uh, 1967, uh, homosexuality was basically illegal. You could go to jail for it, um, which is just crazy when you think about it. Uh, crazy, incredibly harmful. Um, so, and it is the, the the Act of Parliament sounds pretty brutal, the Sexual Offences Act. But basically, that 1967, from that point onwards, um, homosexuality was acceptable. You know, and and of course, people still object and have issues with it. But again, we've made enormous progress. And uh, and this whole period, late 60s, uh, sort of 1960s through to the mid 70s, this was an example of social liberalism. You might want to write that down. It's really important social liberalism so social meaning people and their interactions with each other and we're going to draw a distinction here between economic and social so this is social liberalism and it's usually associated with the left of british politics i thought about this the other day and basically the right doesn't always have a problem with social liberalism i mean some right wingers are actually social social liberals boris johnson claims to be a social liberal and i'm not sure whether he is but he claims to be um but this isn't the same as left and right we'll talk about that in a moment so this is social liberalism and there was a big revolution in the 60s and 70s so slide 14 where are we now um so in the 60s and 70s what happened was many young people rediscovered marx Karl Marx's teachings and, and they identified other groups of oppressed people so Marx was all about uh, the, the, the oppression of the working class that's what Marx co concentrated on so it's an economic issue to Marx um, but the thinkers the, the students of so the, the famously radical students of the 1960s they took that a step f further and said well oppression is not just an economic issue but it's also a social issue. So women are oppressed, ethnic minorities are oppressed, LGBTQ people are oppressed, disabled people are oppressed, you know? And in modern times, there has been a resurgence of interest in other oppressed groups. So Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Women's Pay at the BBC, all of these recent issues, you could say, are an extension of Marx's thinking because Marx is all about oppression and, and, and discovering oppression and, and, and uh, rectifying oppression. And even though people who represent Black Lives Matter, they might not mention Karl Marx, really they are, they are sort of indirectly inspired by his thinking. And also they're, they're associated with being a group on the left as well. And, and one of the phrases that you hear now, sometimes often in fact used in a pejorative sense, uh, focusing on one of these groups is sometimes called as I identity politics. And personally, I, I do worry about this a little bit because w what's happening these days is you, you almost have this like atomization of political causes. So you have Black Lives Matter, which is a completely noble cause, but, but it stands alone as a separate cause from, say, Me Too or from LGBTQ rights. So they, th this is what people mean by identity politics. It's the most important factor in somebody's life. So if the factor is ethnicity or if the factor is sexual orientation, that becomes the most important factor and all other considerations are pushed to the side. The environment, you know, I, I know quite a few environmentalists and they're, they're really interested in the environment, but they're not interested in socioeconomic class, which I find remarkable. So in the 60s and 70s, the Labour Party kind of combined all of these causes in, into, into one progressive movement. Uh, and personally, I think that's that's the way forward with left wing politics in the UK and elsewhere is to combine them. As soon as you start fragmenting into different groups, into so-called identity politics, you know, the powers that be, it's easy for them to pick you off. It's called divide and conquer. It's a well-known uh, uh, military technique. You divide people up and then you, you, you one by one, you destroy them, you know. So anyway, that's just me on my soapbox uh, talking about uh, fragmentation of politics. So slide 15. So the thing to remember here, the, the, the punchline, I'm getting to the punchline here, slowly but surely. So we, we know about the history of left-wing politics. And what, what I've done there, hopefully, is distinguish between two different measurements of politics, economics and social. So Marx was all about economics. He was about the working class. He was about the oppression of people working in factories. He was critical of the profit-making process and of extreme wealth and all that that's economic anything to do with money wealth economic social is all the other stuff how people interact with each other so it's all about sexuality it's all ab about ethnicity it's all about um, women's rights 
uh, and all that sort of stuff. It's about law and order. That's social. So it's really important that you see a, a dis make a distinction between those two things. And if you and if you can make a distinction, then your head and shoulders above all those idiots online who say that the BBC is left wing. Because I don't think that they understand what they're talking about. <clears throat> so my question's there on the on the right in the ovals. My question is, if, if you're going to say the BBC is left wing, do, do you mean it's left wing in terms of its economic reporting? Or is it left wing in terms of its social reporting? Because they're two different things. They're related, but they're not the same. Now, let's move on. And I think I can do this quite quickly because, Chris, they've done the political compass, right? Can you just check in with me? Thank you, Fahana. So, so, um, so you know what the political compass is about. So just to confirm, if anybody's still a bit confused by it. So you've got two scales. Up and down is the social scale, slide 16. Left and right is the economic scale, uh, slide 17. So you put those together and what you get is a, um, a compass that looks like slide 18. Um, so putting some labels on there, conservative at the top. So what I mean here is what we call small c conservative. I'm not talking about the conservative party, all, all, and that's large c conservative, although there are lots of um, uh, large c conservatives who have conservative beliefs. And at the bottom is liberal. So think about it as, the way I always describe this, if you're confused about this, um, particularly the, the women in the audience, you might associate with this. And I, I use it every year and I always get a smile from, uh, from students. So imagine, you're, imagine you're, you're a young woman and you're going out to a party and you're at home. You come downstairs and you say to your parents, right, mum, dad, I'm going out now. Uh, and uh, they look at you and one of your parents says, you're not wearing that short skirt to go out. And the other parent says, oh, leave her alone. She's just enjoying life and being young. Right. So the person, it's usually the father, I guess, who says, you're not going out with a short skirt like that. He's the conservative. OK, so he's the traditionalist. He doesn't like the idea of his little girl going out with a short skirt. Right. He's being, you know, sort of rules. The rules are the rules. You know, he's restricting in some way and your mother typically the liberal it could be the other way around she says i'll let her do what she wants so she's the liberal and the father in this example is the conservative that's what social uh, the social scale means you know to what extent do you believe that people should be left to their own devices to make up their own rules so things like legalization of marijuana that's a liberal argument you know if people want to smoke weed let them smoke weed it doesn't cause that much trouble let them do it you know that's liberalism Conservative would say, no, it's an illegal drug. It leads on to harder things and we've got to stop it. That's a conservative position. So that's the social. And the left wing, I'll talk about that. The left wing, right wing, I'll talk about that in a moment. Oh, in fact, I'll talk about it on slide 19. <clears throat> so what you then get is labels. So watch out for these labels. So on the left, economically, so this is all about wealth creation, wealth distribution and so on. And, and these labels are kind of pretty accurate, but they are misunderstood and, and uh, misused. So on the far left, on the far left, real far left left wing politics is communist. So a communist is somebody who believes that all economic resources should be collectively owned. So we all own everything. Right. So every so there's no such thing as personal possessions. You know, there's no such thing as money. You know, the, the society operates on a completely different uh, way of thinking. So that and it's never really been tried. People say that Russia was a communist state or China. They, they were not not really, not really. In, in some ways they were, but in other ways they weren't. Um, so socialist, the next step down is quite a reduction from communism. Um, so so socialism is, is, all, is all about the collective, uh, the collective again. But people still have a lot of individual freedoms and a lot of individual choices. Social Democrat is kind of a watered down version of socialism. And then on the right, you've got capitalists and you've got on the far right, neoliberal and neoliberals, incidentally. And I, I actually know people who believe this. They believe that everything should be privately owned. So the health service would be privately owned. Even the, the streets outside your home, somebody would own it and charge you um, you know, rent for walking across the street or something, you know, I mean, th th there is a theoretical and intellectual case for that sort of economic system. And I think it would absolutely destroy the planet, to tell you the truth. But but it does exist in the textbooks. So just be aware. The point is that on the left right spectrum, there are loads and loads and loads of um, different variations on <clears throat> on left wing and right wing. Let's just go back to the social scale. Slide 20. 
And again, if this was a real class, I'd say so, give some examples and conservative and liberal positions, but we're running out of time. So, yeah, so I mentioned marijuana, so that's the classic example. Uh, the abortion law, conservatives think that abortion should be banned. You, you see this a lot in America. In America, they call it pro-life or pro-choice are the two positions. So pro-life, a very emotive word, isn't it, phrase? So pro-life conservatives say that abortion should be banned in every example, in every instance, apart from incest, which is just like the most awful thing you can possibly imagine. Uh, liberals say that uh, abortion should be a, a, a choice based on the, women's, the woman's choice, the person who's actually pregnant, and a, a doctor advising from a medical point of view. So that's the liberal position. So you all understand what conservative and liberal are. Think about the two parents and the short skirt. You know, that's, that's liberal conservative. Uh, and think about some issues as well. The EU, um, typically speaking, the EU, uh, people, uh, people who voted leave, they did tend to be conservative on the social scale. Um, LGBTQ rights. Conservatives aren't really that comfortable with LGBTQ rights, like same-sex marriage and that sort of thing. A liberal, completely comfortable. No, no issue whatsoever. Multiculturalism, again, liberals tend to be very co uh, comfortable with multiculturalism. Conservatives, not so. And it can get quite extreme sometimes and, and, and become racism. Uh, women's rights, conservatives typically think about traditionalism. <clears throat> so conservatives uh, typically will be, be saying, you know, that, 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 that women, you know, are... Are, are different to men and women need to be at home looking after the kids and doing the cleaning. That is a traditional point of view and that is typically on the conservative side. And marijuana we've spoken about as well is the classic example. Liberals will be in favour of legalising it. Conservatives think it's the most evil thing ever and uh, think that it should remain uh, illegal or even be punished more severely. Um, so who holds these positions? Conservatives. Um, I, I've put on here H. That's a friend of mine. Believe it or not, I have a friend. <laughs> I have several friends. I have a friend uh, called Henry, and he's quite a bit older than me. He's probably about 70, but he's extremely conservative. So on all of those issues, EU, law and order, multiculturalism, women's rights and marijuana, he and I completely disagree. OK, so I'm the G in the liberal section. Henry is the H in the conservative section. Um, so who tends to hold the views? Typically older people like Henry tend to be um, conservative. You look, at the, you look at the profile of conservative party voters, you look at the profile of people who voted for the EU to leave the EU, they tended to be older people. Younger people like yourselves tend to be more liberal, particularly if you live in urban areas. So young multicultural Londoners, that's how I categorise my students basically, that you are mostly. I, I, I would describe you, there are a few exceptions, some of you come from other parts of the UK or Europe, uh, but typically <coughs> the students we get are young multicultural Londoners. One of the best things of the jobs is, is meeting everybody and getting different perspectives. So younger people, urban centres, people um, uh, in Europe, for example, I put Europe there, in Asia, Middle East and Africa, the political view, the general political view tends to be more conservative than in Europe. So in Europe in general, we are much more liberal, say, than in West Africa or Southeast Asia or so. And that's for lots of historic and cultural reasons. Um, so just be aware that there are differences within societies and within even friendship groups like uh, me and Henry. So that's the social scale. Hopefully that all makes sense. So I tried to give you some examples. The key point here is that you understand the difference between economic scale and social scale. OK, that's the key point. So slide 23, going on to economic scale. Again, G and H. I'm over there on the left. Henry's over there on the right. So I believe that some economic resources should be collectively owned. For example, I believe that Jeremy Corbyn's idea to provide a state run broadband to every home in the home in the land. That's a left wing idea. And it was ridiculed at the time in 2019. But hey, guess what? Come COVID, everybody needs broadband in their home. And the people who don't have it are the poorest in society. And left wing is all about helping the poorest in society. You know, so that's an example of a left wing idea. Henry, of course, on the right would have hated that idea. I'm sure he still does. I've not seen him for a long time. But on the right hand side, private ownership. So everybody, you know, you reduce taxes. Everybody has as much disposable income as possible and they spend it as they want. But you don't get free stuff from the state. You don't get welfare. You don't get health care and so on. So that's the economic scale. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do, because we're running out of time, I'm just going to skip forward. Um, slide 24, this gives you some examples 
um, of the politics of economics. So we're talking purely economics here. So state ownership is a left-wing idea. Higher taxes, left-wing idea. Public investment, public services, higher welfare payments, etc. So think about the collective, the collective, and that's a left-wing idea. Right is all about individualism, privatisation, lower taxes. Sounds good, doesn't it? But lower taxes means fewer public services, lower welfare payments, etc. So the right is all about individualism. OK, so that ma make sure that you understand that distinction. Public opinion, slide 25, pretty much is across the spectrum. So most people believe in the middle, a little bit of collectivism and a little bit of individualism. So the health service, but you're still, you know, we still want lower taxes, which is a difficult circle to square, that one. Uh, but public opinion exists across the whole spectrum. Slide 26, who holds these views? Well, traditionally, the Labour Party has been over there, particularly under Jeremy Corbyn on the left-hand side. Environmentalists. Think about environmentalism. It's all about the collective. It's about us as a humanity, as a planet. I mean, you can't get more collective than that. And environmentalists also argue for the reduction in, in pollution from factories who are trying to make profits, you know, or pollution from airliners or whatever. So right-wingers don't really like environmentalists because it's in, it puts a restriction <coughs> on the profit-making process. Some NGOs like Oxfam, um, Christian Aid and things like that, minority parties, SNP, Plaid Cymru and Wales, and some writers and public intellectuals. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, unashamedly, I think most academics in the social sciences tend to be on the left. Um, so public intellectuals, people like me and Dr. Roberts, you know, we tend to be over there on that side of um, the spectrum. Spectrum. And uh, slide number uh, 20, um, where are we? Uh, 27, who holds the, 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 the views on the right? Well, typically a Conservative Party, obviously UKIP. They're even more to the right than the Conservative Party. Here's the key point. Companies. So big companies, whether it's Facebook or Google or Tesco or British Airways, they, they typically like privatisation. They typically like lower taxes because it means more profit for their shareholders. Uh, you know, and the thing is that most newspapers are privately owned companies, as you know. So that's one of the reasons that they're on the right as well. So the Daily Mail, the Telegraph, the Sun, because they are commercial organisations, they want lower taxes too. And, and they want fewer regulations on their companies. So they tend to be over there on the right. So you can see the spectrum here. There's a distinct bunch of people who believe typically right wing views. Uh, another bunch of people who typically believe, believe le um, left-wing views. And the BBC charter, getting to the punchline of the first part of today's show, the BBC's charter says the BBC should be bang in the middle. So in debates and discussions, it should not give favouritism to either left or right. The critics say, however, slide number 29, that the BBC is over there um, on the left. So remember, slide 30, I'm going to go through this quite quickly because I was, I'm way over time here. So remember, there are two political scales, two political scales. You've got the social scale going up and down and the economic scale left and right. 31, it says do the test. You've done the test, as I understand it, according to uh, Chris's Moodle comments. Um, I've done the test and I'm down here, bottom left, and I suspect you are as well, folks, because every time I've done the test with students, I think Chris would agree with this. Um, you all tend to be down here on the left, liberal and left wing, um, where the G is. And I don't think many of you will be up there on the top right with Henry. Um, just to put that into perspective, slide number 32. Um, if you were in the top right, I hate to tell you this, folks, but you're in the same space as Nigel Farage. Uh, it's not a very pleasant thought, is it? Uh, and, well, you might be equally offended by who you are actually with down in the bottom left. But that's where Jeremy Corbyn stands. He's a liberal and he's a left winger liberal and a left winger. But it's important to remember, slide number 32, <coughs> that there are two other quadrants in the political compass. And when I've done the political compass before, hardly anybody in the class is in the other two quadrants. So top left, it is possible to be left wing and conservative. And my dear old departed father, God rest his soul, um, I got along with him very, very well. But he was a bit of a conservative. He was a bit of a traditionalist. Uh, in terms of social policy, but he was as much of a left winger as me. And this is quite typically the working class folks up in the north of England. Um, and these are the people essentially who voted conservative at the last general election. 
So they're left-wing and socially conservative. A lot of them voted conservative uh, for the Conservative Party at the left last election. And then, bottom right, you've got left-wing... Uh, sorry, you've got liberal, socially liberal and right-wing. Right-wing and liberal. And Boris Johnson, this is where Boris Johnson says that he is. So Boris Johnson says that he's completely comfortable with multiculturalism, LGBTQ rights and, and so on. When you actually hear what he writes when you read what he writes and what he says i'm not convinced about that i th well I, th I, th I just think he's, he's he's one of those people who just habitually lies all that that's my take personal opinion so when he says he's a liberal a social liberal I, I do doubt it sometimes think about technology entrepreneurs people like elon musk and uh, jeff bezos and mark zuckerberg they, they tend to be very right wing in terms they don't don't like paying taxes do they facebook and google and so on um, but they are, you know, very liberal, socially liberal. So, so just think about those four positions. And I would actually suggest that this is at the top. It says GJM's estimate. So this is my estimate. I would suggest that the BBC is over there as well. So I personally think, um, based on my thinking and my analysis and reading and research, that the BBC is not left wing at all. I think it's economically on the right, but I also think it's socially liberal, marginally socially liberal marginally socially liberal so slide 33 just a warning please don't use left wing as a synonym for liberal so if you mean socially liberal say socially liberal america in america the word liberal also means left wing it gets a bit confusing and of course in this country we have the liberal party with a big l um you know which gets confusing as well because they are actually on the right to some extent okay so so that's kind of summing up the the political compass and explaining or, or hinting very strongly that I think what happens is that people call the BBC left wing. What they really mean is that it's liberal, is socially liberal. But of course, all these idiots on Facebook are, are, are not smart enough to be able to articulate that. So going back, slide 34, to how we can test the hypothesis that the BBC is over on the left. So as academics, this is essentially what we do when we do PhDs and when we do research um, 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 re research projects, we, we come up with a hypothesis, a theory, uh, you know, a premise, if you like. And then we think it through logically and how do we test it? So slide 35, the way that we do it, again, we discussed this in class if we were all face to face, but the way that you can test whether a news organisation is left wing or not is you look firstly at which issues the organisation covers. So whether it's on their news agenda or not. So something like Black Lives Matter. If a news organisation doesn't even discuss Black Lives Matter, doesn't even discuss it, right, that, that means that that news organisation doesn't think that Black Lives Matter is important. So, so that completely invalidates that, that movement by not discussing it. You know, it's not an issue. Second point is what perspectives does the, do the news items have? So let's assume that a news organisation does cover Black Lives Matter, it can cover it in a number of ways. It can cover it in a sympathetic way and say the protesters have got a, a case, or it can cover it in a sort of neutral way, or it can do it in a very critical way. And it says these protesters are, you know, are disruptive anarchists or whatever it might be. So you can look, first of all, at which issues the organisation covers. So if it's on the agenda, then it's clearly important. You can look at what perspectives the news items have have um, either positive negative or neutral you can also look at who's quoted in the news items a classic example here is if there's an industrial dispute and this does actually happen on the bbc um, you know for example a couple of years ago there were lots of strikes on the trains in london south london a lot of students found it difficult to get into in onto campus um, so who's quoted uh, quite often news items would quote disgruntled passengers you know I met there's no trains this morning and I couldn't get to work and then they might quote the manager of the train company or the boss of the train company and sometimes they actually quote the workers as well now if I was a journalist I'd want to know why are you on strike folks you know but quite often um, the people who are actually striking are not quoted and then you find out when they are that actually they, they've got a pretty good case because they're getting paid less and their holiday time has been reduced and etc 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 so who's quoted 
can tell you whether an organize, a news organisation is taking a left-wing perspective or not. And finally, what type of language is used to describe people on ideas? So are protesters described as, uh, uh, are they campaigning, are they crusading, are they uh, m campaigning for a better future, or are they just trying to destroy people's lives by blocking the streets? Think about Extinction Rebellion last year and the year before. So that's what we can do. And we, we can measure all of those things. Slide 36, we can actually measure them. We can quantify them and qualify them. So if the BBC really is left wing, it would cover, going back to slide 36, it would cover left wing ideas. It would cover left wing ideas, point number two, from a positive perspective. It would also, point number three, quote left wingers, people like Jeremy Corbyn, Ken Livingstone, George Galloway, remember him people like that in news items and it would also fourth point describe left-wing causes in a very positive way so if the BBC really was left-wing let me just go through that again it would cover left-wing issues from a positive point of view it would quote predominantly left-wingers and it would do it in a very sympathetic way so that's if the BBC was left-wing which leads me neatly onto and this isn't self-promotion folks I promise you this leads me neatly on to my book. Now, my book uh, is called the. Uh, the I forgot what it's called. <laughs> it's so long ago since I wrote it. Actually, not that long ago, 2019. The political content of British economic, business, and financial journalism. It is available at the library in uh, ebook form. I wouldn't recommend reading all of it because it is a bit boring. Sorry about that, folks. But they do have to be academic books. Um, but you might want to dip into it. One chapter to read, I think, is chapter three. So what I did, chapter three, it's a long story, literally, but in 1999, there was a conference in Seattle in uh, Northwest United States. It was called the WTO, the World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference. And basically, um, important people, bigwigs from all over the world, politicians, business people, got together at this big conference to discuss the next round of trade. It sounds desperately boring, but it was actually really, really, really important. Um, and so it's a big conference and there are also big protests there as well. Slide number 38. Slide 38. And what they were discussing was this thing called uh, was world trade. And what we academics call it is economic globalization. And so this meeting essentially changed the way that trade was done, the rules of trade around the world. And I won't bore you with the details here, but essentially there were four political positions. So the first thing I did when I did this case study, when I analyzed this, was to figure out what people believed. So reading articles and reading books and thinking it through and discussing it with my supervisor, I realized that there were essentially four positions. There were two on the left and two on the right. So the red pink ones are left wing um, uh, sort of opinions. And on the right, the, the blue ones are the right wing opinions. So essentially, I called them fundamentalists, people who believed on the left hand side that the World Trade, Trade Organization should be completely um, eradicated and, and a new organization put in its place that prioritizes the planet, environment, workers' rights and so on. The reformists, not quite as left wing, they said, well, the World Trade Organization is OK, but it needs to take workers' rights and the environment and so on into consideration more. Then on the right, you had the protectionists who basically wanted to keep everything as it was. And then on the far right, you had the liberalizers and they believed in what's called free trade. So a, a, remo a removal of all restrictions on, on trade, environmental restrictions, workers rights and all that. So th this concept of free trade and they're on the right hand side. So I, I could talk about this at great length, but just so long as you understand that there are essentially four positions, two on the left, two on the right. The key point here is that the protesters were outside the conference, slide 20, 39. They were outside the conference. They weren't involved in the discussion. Inside the conference building itself, it was business people, World Trade Organization and politicians. And they all basically agreed. They all had a right wing position, essentially on free trade, on free trade. So the left were outside, the right were on the inside. Slide number 40, the way that I did it. So if you're um, thinking about dissertations for next year, folks, uh, this is uh, what's called uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis. Uh, you wouldn't be expected to do anything as, as huge as this. This is a, cha a chapter for a PhD, uh, but you could certainly follow a similar method. So what I did when I, uh, when I analyzing the, 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 the media reports of this particular event, what I did, 
I did an online search with the keywords globalization, anti-globalization, world trade organization and WTO. So any article that mentioned any of those words over that period, November the 1st to December the 31st, 1999. And right in the middle of that was the, the conference. So four weeks before the conference and four weeks after. And what I did was a comparative study. And this was really, dare I say so myself, the, the genius of my plan. So I wanted to find out whether the BBC was left wing or not. So what I did is I compared it, the BBC's reporting, with two newspapers that do have very distinct political positions. So the Guardian Observer, we know, is a left wing newspaper. So I analysed the Guardian Observer um, reporting of this event over this period and also the Times and the Sunday Times. So I did a keyword search on those uh, four phrases over that period. I did the search on the BBC News website, the Guardian um, um, newspaper and the Times through something called LexisNexis. So I generated a total of 488 articles. There were 42 variables. So every article had 42 characteristics. That's 20,000 units of data, 13,000 words, a 38 page appendix and six months work. Now I put all that on there because if there was one of those people from Facebook earlier saying that the BBC is left wing, there's my justification for what I'm going to say. OK, it was six months work and a lot of analysis and 20,000 units of data. I suspect those people on Facebook earlier, they may have read one article if you're lucky. But this is the problem we academics have. That's what we're battling against is people who are really badly informed and uh, prejudiced as well. Anyway, we try our best. Let's move on. Slide 41. So I could talk at great length about this. Um, I've got 13,000 words in the article, so um, in the chapter, so I could tell you all about it. But what I want to do is, is, is just focus on one particular thing. So part of my analysis was looking at discourse. And this is, I don't know whether Chris has mentioned, but this, this is Chris's uh, uh, academic passion, really, is discourse analysis. And one reason that Chris loves it, and the reason I love it as well, is it's incredibly revealing. And one thing it can do is it can tell you the extent to which news reports give credence or believability or credibility, whatever you want to call it, give credence, believability, credibility to the particular political positions. So what this involves is reading the articles really, really closely and looking at the words the journalist uses to describe people. And you could do this with Black Lives Matter protests. It's, it's very good to do it with protests. Think about how the journalist describes people. Or think about the, uh, uh, the, the, the January the 6th, um, can't call them protest, almost revolution on the steps of the capital in America. How did newspapers in America and Britain describe those people? You know? So you can, you can find a lot about a newspaper's or a news organization's political position by looking at the way it describes people. So slide 42, here's a photograph of the protesters at the WTO conference in Seattle in 1999. Now the key point here is I'm going to look at the description by three news, three news organisations of exactly the same event on exactly the same day. Right, so three journalists, three newspapers, same event, same day. So slide 43, The Guardian. This is what The Guardian says. As expected, more than 60,000 people marched in carnival spirits on the conference hall. Environmentalists, students and an eclectic array of causes joined steel workers and dockers to fill the city street, uh, city centre with colour and noise. Sounds very positive, doesn't it? It's like a big party and it, and it kind of reflects what you see in the, in the, in the um, photograph there. There's different groups, so environmentalists, students and steel workers. You know, imagine these big sort of macho, muscular steel workers with, you know, sort of calm, peaceful environmentalists, you know. So it's all of God's humanity, you know, on a, on a sort of positive mission to make the world a better place. It sounds like Glastonbury, doesn't it? And that's kind of what you'd expect from The Guardian. So the Guardian is what you might call soft left, you know, left of centre. It, it, you know, it, it's, it, it follows environmental causes. Its students typically are very keen readers of the Guardian and so on. So that's kind of what you'd expect. So that's the Guardian. So Guardian get a big tick because they've uh, they've uh, they've um, 
followed their, their traditional editorial line. Slide 44, here's the Times, owned by Rupert Murdoch. So this is the journalist of the Times. This is how he or she saw it. The same event, same day. A motley crew of steel workers, environmentalists, poverty campaigners and feminist witches has succeeded in outwitting the most powerful governments in the world and hijacking the WTO agenda. Exactly, Fahana. So think about this. So he or she is describing a steel workers and environmentalists. The Guardian men uh, uh, journalist mentions those. The Guardian men journalist doesn't mention feminist witches. And it also doesn't use the phrase motley crew. A motley crew is like a rabble, you know, a bunch of idiots, a bunch of violent, destructive fools, you know. Not only that, they've hijacked the World Trade Organization agenda. OK, so the Times has reported it in a very negative way. It, he or she has used the same basic raw information and twisted it and turned it into this menacing representation of who the people are. So we've got The Guardian being quite supportive. We've got The Times being negative. Incidentally, for Hannah, let me just say about feminist witches, this is what you might call, uh, it, what, what they're doing here is trying to ridicule. It's kind of like guilt by association, isn't it? You know, it's like being at school when you get associated by the bad boy with, with the bad boy in class, you know? So because you're his mate, therefore you're bad, you know? So steel workers, because they're associated, feminist witches, I'm not sure what exactly that involves, but let's take it literally, you know, feminist witches. So, so they're basically saying steel workers, oh, just put them with the feminist witches, you know, not, nothing wrong with being a feminist. I'm not sure about witches, but, you know, but it's, so it's kind of guilt by association. So that's the Times. So we've got The Guardian left, you know, sort of soft left. We've got The Times. Uh, which is uh, clearly trying to ridicule these uh, left-wingers. Let's move on to the BBC. So slide 45, we'd expect the BBC to be down the middle. We'd expect a really plain, direct, simple explanation and description of who these people are. However, what you actually get from the BBC is as follows. First word, anarchists, environmentalists, union members, human rights activists and religious groups have descended on Seattle with a common purpose to protest against the World Trade Organization. Among the protesters are Wiccans, feminist neo-pagan lovers of nature and magic, who say the WTO values free trade over the goddess. This is the BBC. And if I had one piece of evidence to throw to those idiots on Facebook who said the BBC is left-wing, I would throw this at them. And it's not just this protest that the BBC does this. When you look at other radical movements, the BBC has a habit of moving down the track, the same track as the Times. It's not quite as explicit as the Times. It's, it's much more sort of in, by implication. But the first word, anarchist, you are so immediately anarchist. Most people would say that anarchy is bad. Anarchist and then environmentalist. So, so you put them in the same sentence and hence they become connected. And then in the second paragraph, the journalist goes even further. I actually had to uh, Google Wiccan. A Wiccan is uh, is um, basically a pagan religion. Uh, somebody is a sort of you know sort of believes in sort of nature and all that sort of stuff. So again, the journalist is ridiculing the noble cause. The Wiccans, feminist, neo-pagan lovers of nature and magic, who say the WT. I mean that 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 journalist there is is just trying to discredit that bunch of people. It's like sort of nudging somebody, aren't they crazy, you know? So that's the BBC. It's not quite as brutal as, as, as the Times, but it's all there by insinuation and so on. So that's not what you'd, that's not what you'd expect from a left-wing organisation. If the BBC were left-wing, it would be more like The Guardian, but it's not. It's more like The Times. Slide 46. So the credence, now this is just one example, and it's, it's really important that you don't just use one example. And the reason a PhD is so hard and you really earn your PhD is, like I said, I analysed 488 articles, not just one. I didn't just analyse one article. This was the most extreme example. But all the way through the, the reporting of this event, the BBC consistently slide 46 was over there on the right with the times the reporting was more had more in common with the times than it did with the guardian time after time after time so my conclusion for that chapter and for this part of the show slide 47 characteristics of bbc reports so this is for the whole 
of the globalization uh, chapter. So this is the whole of the 13,000 word chapter. So the debate, basically, think about the measurements we, we, we laid out before. If the BBC were left wing, what would it do? So the debate was led and dominated by the developed world elite. So developed world, Europe, North America, Australia, Canada, and so on, places like that. The world elite are the business people and the politicians. So basically, the, the BBC's coverage was focused on what the what uh, what privileged powerful people said from rich countries that's what the, so that's not really a left wing position karl marx wouldn't agree with that you know that is a proper right wing position traditionalist second point free trade in speech marx was generally accepted as inevitable and virtuous don't forget free trade is a right wing point of view but the bbc just kind of accepted it as well it's going to happen and it's it's fine it's good you know um, developing countries africa asia elsewhere were largely ignored if the BBC were left wing, it would give much more exposure to what developing countries want out of this. The critics, as we've seen, were lumped together and ridiculed or ignored. And the thing that really annoyed me was that there were very few academics or economists quoted. Now, you'd think this is an economic issue. Well, you know, trade is a big economic issue. So you'd think, well, economists know quite a lot about trade. So let's get the experts in. But they only accounted for eight out of 247 sources. And academics were, were hardly quoted either. And journalists, believe it or not, were quoted more than academics. So journalists speaking to each other. That's something you notice. I don't know whether Chris has touched on that. But t Chris talks about the elite discourse and networks and all that. But it is essentially journalists talking to journalists. So Evan Davis interviewing Robert Peston. What do you think about this? You know? So it's journalists just talking to each other. Key point at the bottom, summing it all up, the BBC's coverage of the globalization and debate in 1999 was far closer to the right-wing times than the left-wing guardian <coughs> and, and i've spoken about my work before to uh, people and they say yeah well that was just one issue over one time and then i say well slide 48 slide 48 i did two other chapters in this book and they both came up with the same essential answer so i did one chapter four about private finance and public services and again, the BBC was very close to the right wing position and it wasn't very close to the left wing position on this. So that was further confirmation that the BBC is actually to the, the right. Uh, so slide 49, let's just round off and we'll have a quick break. Um, so the idea that the BBC is left wing, let's go back. I mean, this is kind of what this part of the presentation is all about. This idea that the BBC is left wing, it gets accused of it um, quite vehemently and vigorously online. Um, so partly that's what my book was about and my PhD was about and Chris will point you at other research that has found or concentrated on a similar space. So my conclusion after doing all that work, there is no evidence to support this that the BBC is left wing in the globalisation case study. There's no evidence in the second chapter in the PFI case study. So I would conclude that this is an oft repeated and often repeated self perpetuating myth. That's me personally saying that. You know, other people might find uh, uh, might find it uh, different, but I'm, I'm yet to read any book uh, that says so. Um, next line, my research also tallies, agrees with other content studies. For example, the Glasgow University Media Group has done a lot of work on this over the years. Check them out. Media Lens is another is an organisation that that frequently writes about this. And and the bottom line for me uh, here and for these other people is that the BBC's, notice the words, coverage of business and economics is far closer to the right-wing Telegraph and Times than the left-wing Guardian. So in terms of economics and business, the BBC, in my experience, based on my research, is to the right. Now, crucial point, slide 50. This is where I think people, this is my interpretation, I think this is where people get it wrong. So when Farage and other people say the BBC is left wing, they're confusing it. They're, they're, it's, it's just a convenient label, which is actually very inaccurate. So perhaps the critics issue with the BBC is not that it's left wing in economic terms, but that it's liberal. I personally think the more I think about it, that's what the issue is. So Farage and people like that and uh, traditional conservatives like my friend Henry, that's what they have a problem with. They, they're not comfortable with LGBTQ rights. They're not comfortable with um, Black Lives Matter protests. They're not comfortable with multiculturalism. So what they do is they say that the BBC is left wing because the BBC, for all its faults, is actually making progress in, in terms of representation. And we'll talk about that in the second part of the, of the show.
So I think people are actually confusing two things. When they say left wing, what they mean is liberal and they don't like liberal because they're conservative. But I've not tested that. What I've done with my research is economic reporting. And I'm sure there are studies, if not, there should be about the BBC social reporting. I'm sure there are. Maybe Chris knows about some. But um, but that, that could be an exciting area of research. So just rounding off now for the uh, for the for the end of this part, further reading uh, my book slide 51 is at the library uh, i think chris has already mentioned this one the, the report should he stay or should he go uh by i think that was uh was that justin schlossberg uh, about jeremy corbyn and there's another paper there about jeremy corbyn and also a great book the bbc myth of a public service by tom mills okay folks as always i've gone way over time um can we just have a quick break so i can get a cup of tea and then we'll finish off with another half of half hour of fascinating revelations so anybody got any questions comments before we um, have a break